Hey guys, Gary J here. Today we're looking at a Kamasori straight razor from Japan. A Kamasori straight razor from Japan. And uh, it's a very interesting design. Now the Kamasori, uh, the word Kamasori means razor in Japan. It can refer to an older straight razor like this. It can refer to a modern day three track, four track, five track um, shaving razor. It can refer to a electric shaving razor. It's still called a Kamasuri. So uh, looking at this particular design right here, um, you may have seen one of these. Sometimes I don't think people look at straight razors too much anymore. Now I'm one of these people that shave with a straight razor and uh, I use the uh, cutthroat a Western style straight razor we see in America. And uh, that would be one like this right here. And you're probably familiar seeing these right here on Western movies. But again, I shave every day with a straight razor. So uh, I like straight razors. But the uh, Japanese Kamasuri is a very nice, wonderful razor here too. And uh, so we just want to look at that a little bit. Uh, if we look at the history of this particular design right here and the history of this it basically is uh you go back uh seven eight hundred years ago uh buddhist monks priests came from uh korea and went to japan and they brought this particular design now japan already had some uh different types of straight razor but this particular design was brought by the Buddhist monks and so forth. Now, why would a Buddhist monk or a priest need to have a straight razor? Well, uh, they shaved their whole head. They shaved all their facial hair. They even shaved their eyebrows off. So I did, they did a lot of shaving. And, and most of the time, they're not doing this by themselves. They have someone else to help them do that. And then when you look at the era of Bushido with the samurai, the samurai started shaving their face too, uh, perhaps to influence of um, Buddhism and whatnot, but they would shave the crown of their head too. If you look at those old samurai movies, and so that was kind of interesting. Uh, so that's where the origin of this design came from. There are other there. Japan has double sided blades too that are used for straight razors, but uh, that particular design here, again, is from uh, the Buddhist. Uh, monks and priests. Uh, looking at the anatomy of this blade right here, it's a lot different than uh, a cutthroat razor like this. Now, the reason they call this cutthroat is because it was uh, you could cut a man's throat with it uh, when you're shaving him. And this one right here um, is thicker right here and right here. Uh, let's see if we can get that in focus. Okay. Now this right here, uh, you on the on the cutthroat version, this right here which should be like six o'clock straight down. But if you look at this right here, the blade makes a turn outward to like a five thirty position instead of six o'clock. And uh, the back side of this blade right here, all of this is flat from uh, the the sharp edge right here, all the way up to here, all this is flat as a pancake. Okay, that's flat. And that's called the amote, O-M-O-T-E, amote. And on the other side here, this is hollow ground here, where this pen is. This is actually hollow ground too, on this side right here where you don't, you don't see uh, the shiny part here. But on this side here, it's called the ura, Yura is uh, always has the uh, writing on them right here. Okay, this writing uh, that you'll see on there, that's on the Ura. So, uh, it's just kind of beautifully done. Another thing about these blades too is that uh, there's two types of metal here. On the back side here, this is a soft metal iron type metal on the Amote, and on the Ura is a 
hard steel right here. Now you can see a line sometimes in these right here uh, where the uh, uh, soft metal will run into the hard metal here or the hard metal here runs out and you only have soft metal. If you get to that point, then this blade is pretty much useless. You won't be able to sharpen it again. So you have to kind of watch out for that. Another thing is when you look at the writings here on the uh, blade, some have a little bit of writing. Some may only have a couple of, of Japanese uh, lettering here. Some of them may have a lot. This one has a lot, and it's even got a little stamp down here. Uh, so we call this the uh, kanji. The kanji here, here has the name of the maker of this particular blade. Now, the maker of this particular blade, uh, according to the kanji here, which is important to know because he was a master blade maker of straight razors. And so uh, it's important to know that. But the kanji here tells us it's by a fellow by the name of Inoue Tosika. Inoue Tosika. Now, I may be mispronouncing his name a little bit because I don't speak Japanese, but uh, I'm trying to pronounce it the way I've heard it spoken. Uh, so, Inoue uh, Tosika. So, that's a, that's a really good brand of this type of blade. Now, you have some blades that are just kind of generic blades, but if you want something that's kind of more collectible, you would look for that. Uh, he was renowned as a blade maker, uh, Inoue Tosika. Now, his teacher before him, who taught him everything he knows, was really a grandmaster blade maker. Uh, he was also he also had a doctorate degree. He he studied uh, ancient samurai swords. He studied metallurgy. He studied the history of all that stuff. I think he even came up with his own type of steel uh, configuration that he wanted. And uh, uh, he was just incredible uh, teacher as well. And uh, his name was. Kasuki Iwasaki, Kasuki Iwasaki, and uh, he was just an incredible guy there. So if you get anything made by him, and you you would look at the kanji here to find out his name, or it would be somewhere here. Now, what happened, too, was that a lot of these people who, uh, like on this particular one here, Inoa Tasiki, his name is here, but uh, he may or may not have made this particular blade himself because his students could also use his name. But if he made it, sometimes he would put a symbol where uh, to let you know that this was personally made by him. Another interesting thing, too, is that in 1866, 1866, a year after American Civil War in Japan, they were having their problems, too. And... Uh, that's when um, they outlawed samurai swords in Japan. So that was a big blow toward the samurai. Now, there's a movie called The Last Samurai with uh, Tom Cruise. And uh, the uh, that movie is based on uh, that particular law by the Japanese government to ban the samurai sword and end the samurai era, so to speak. They may have taken away the swords of the samurai, but they didn't take away the Bushido spirit of the samurai. Later, Japan would make samurai swords again and give them to the, uh, their soldiers, especially in World War II. So uh, what did that mean, basically, that uh, in 1866, when it was outlawed that you couldn't make samurai swords anymore, nor could you possess samurai swords, some of the great samurai swords were hidden and never, never confiscated or turned in. So uh, those are worth a lot of money. Some of those are. So anyway, uh, since the sword makers could no longer make swords, they turned to making uh, blades like this right here, and culture item uh, blades and so forth for cutting up animals and meat and veg vegetables and you know all kinds of things like that, scissors, whatever. Uh, they made it. So you had some of the master sword makers making blades like this right here. Uh, so I thought that was very interesting. Uh, and, you know, if you can find a blade 
one of these blades made by one of the great masters, you, you've got something there. One thing I want to mention too is that while these blades are uh, forged and uh, handmade and uh, ground uh, into this particular design and polished out and so forth, uh, it's very unique. Now, some of these are made from uh, tomahogany steel, Japanese tomahogany, which is a famous steel. And if it's made from tomahogany, it may have a Yule uh, Japanese symbol here of some type to let you know that this was not just regular steel, but the famous Japanese tomahogany steel, which makes the value of this go up a whole lot more too. They make uh, these blades out of tomahogany steel even today. They use that old process, which is very laborious. Uh, tomahogany um, blade like this right here, straight razor, could run you between $900 and $1,300 for the same blade just like this, but made out of tomahogany as far as the newer designs and so forth. So there's something to keep in mind. Uh, tomahogany is a old process of making metal, uh, kind of using iron, sand, and coal. Uh, you can look it up, and it's it's very interesting process. Uh, is tomahogany the best steel in the world? No. Japan makes a lot better steel than tomahogany is. But, I mean, tomahogany is just an old school type of metal that they use for hundreds of years. And so that's kind of the tra traditional type thing you want to use. And that's why uh, it brings a value. But, yeah, there's a lot better steel. J Japan, again, makes a lot better steel than tomahogany. I mean, newer process and refinements and all that stuff. Uh, there's superior steel out there for making swords and uh, blades and stuff. Just a little FYI. So one of the advantages and disadvantages of these two types of blades right here. Well, for me, who, again, I shave with straight razors. The Western style blade right here, uh, it has an advantage to me a little bit in the sense that uh, it's got a handle on it. So when you're, this right, this is razor sharp. And I, was, I sharpened it the other day. So you've got a handle here that you can put this sharp blade into and you don't have to worry about cutting yourself. Okay. So that's, that's a nice thing right there. Two, with the handle right here, and you've got this uh, little loop right here on this particular blade. And you've got some ridges cut in here. Uh, it allows you to hold the blade like this right here. You've got a good firm grip on the blade right here. And you can shave very easily with it. You don't have to worry about losing control of the blade. See, I have my finger here. And on this one here, uh, certain parts of your face, you may want to hold the blade right here. It's got a notch cut in this one right here so that you can hold the blade right here uh, in shaving. So I think now that's another good thing about uh, this particular design. And this is ambidextrous because looking at the uh, blade right here, let's see if we get it in focus. If you look at the blade right here, it's ambidextrous because you can shave on the right-hand side of your face or the left-hand side of your face. If you were to draw a line uh, through the center right here, all the way through the blade, it would be a mirror image of both sides. They look identical. Okay, so that's the advantage of having this kind of blade. You have no problem shaving the right or left-hand side of your face. The fact that you can shave on either side of your face with uh, this and you can hold it very securely uh, the way it's designed and made uh, is real nice too. The blade is a little bit long sometimes depending on what part you're trying to shave on your face. Um, but you can close it up and uh, have it the way you want it. Uh, this one right here. Uh, is different because uh, let me take this ruler right here again this part right here is flat all the way across here all that's flat right there 
And this is the part that goes across your, it goes against your face, the whole flat part right here. And so like, say this ruler right here, if this was your face right here or skin, you would just lay the blade down right here. I mean, maybe you can see how flat that is right there. All that's flat. So you lay the, the blade like this right here and you get ready to shave. You tilt it up maybe about 30 degrees like that and then go forward. Uh, I sharpened this blade a couple of hours last night. So try not to dull it. So uh, that's the problem with this one. Now, now shaving, this is, a, they make right and left handed uh, blades like this now. But if I'm shaving the right hand side of my face, I'm right handed. It's real easy for me to do that. But when I go to my left side of my face, then you're really not supposed to shave with the Ura side here. Um, you can, you know, there's no crime to do that, but you're not really supposed to shave with, with this side against your face. If this, was, if this was my face right here, my hand right here, I shouldn't be shaving on that side. So what I'd have to do is turn it around to the flat side here and then turn my face all the way to the left. I mean, to the right. Turn my face all the way to the right and look at the corner of my eye and then shave down this way uh, to do that properly. But that's, you know, probably the only thing that's really kind of different about the um, straight razor here is that you have to, that flat side is supposed to be against your face. Now, a lot of the people back in those days had somebody to shave them, so that was not a problem. But if you're shaving yourself, I mean, you can hone this blade too so that it will it will shave uh, either way. So you can hone it that way too if you want to. So that's one of the things. And again, you see right here, this is totally different than the, uh, the Western cutthroat style because this blade veers off to like instead of six o'clock to like 530 position here and it's thick so that's one advantage there the uh this is very easy to hold and these things are easy to sharpen to me uh, i mean it takes you still have to stroke this thing a lot to get it sharp but it it's it's easier to, in, to me to sharpen and uh if you let me mention sharpening this thing a minute. If you're sharpening, you know, you when, when you're sharpening straight razor, they have to be super sharp. And you go from uh, from probably like uh, eight thousandths grit stone up to sixteen thousand grit. Okay, so I mean, they go way on up. Now, if you're sharpening this one right here, your blade would be this right here. Pretend this is a, um, a, a stone a lot wider than this, but pretend that's a stone right there. Well, you put your blade flat here and you would go all the way down your stone. Um, you go all the way down your stone, flip your blade over and then go back and flip it over and go back and flip it over and go back. That's called a one to one ratio. You're, you're honing this blade evenly on both sides. One, two, one, two so that's you're honing it evenly this is a different breed of razor here now the technique that i used on this one uh there are different techniques out there and you have to get the one choose the one you want to use but most of your uh grinding is, or part that's going to come in contact with your stone is going to be this flat part that's where most of your uh honing is going to be done on and just to give you an idea how that would work, real quick. Um, one, you take the flat edge of the blade, and again, you see that the flat, the flat part of the blade is like right here. You see how flat that is. Uh, so you're just holding that down, and you're just going forward with it, okay? And so that's how simple that is. Just keep that flat. Now, if this was a regular uh, stone here, say 10,000 grit, and I got one that's 10,000 grit, it's, of course, wider. But when you're shaving, I mean, when you're honing with this blade right here, uh, you make, 
Okay, you make 10, 10 strokes to start with, and say that stroke is uh, six inches long on the stroke. That would be a full stroke, say six inches, okay? You would go one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, ten. Go all the way up ten long strokes, okay? So you're going from here to here ten times, the full stroke. Then you flip it over, lay it flat, and make a half a stroke, say three inches instead of six inches. So you just make a half a stroke on this other side. Then you start over. You, you did ten long strokes. You make one half stroke. Now you're going to do five long strokes. Two, three, four, five. You flip it over, and you move it about two and a half inches. That's all you're going to do is two and a half inches, probably. Okay. So now you've done ten. You've done five long strokes. Now you're going to do four long strokes. One, two, three, four. Flip it over. Move the blade about two and a half inches on the back side. I mean on the or side, the, the side that's got the writing on it. So you do four long strokes and then one two and a half inch stroke basically. Now you go to three long strokes and then a two and a half inch stroke. And then you go two long strokes and then a two and a half inch stroke. And then you go to one long stroke and then you go to like two and a half inch stroke. Then you start over and you do it again and again and again. And so if you do that over and over again, uh, say like 10, Five, four, three, two, one are the long strokes, which is a total of 21 long strokes. And then you have six short strokes all together. So this was called that one set. And then you do it again and again, and then you can test the blade, but when you're honing for super sharpness, uh, you're going to be doing it. Well, I sharpened this one for uh, probably an hour and 10 minutes. Uh, with a probably uh, 2000 grit because when I got this one, it had uh, some little chip mark right here, just tiny, tiny chip marks on the edge of that blade right there. So I had to get that off. And so I used like 2000 grit or something like that to get that off. And then I had to go up and finish it up with like 10,000 grit to get it really, really sharp. And so I spent like hour, 10 minutes doing uh, getting the blade flat again on this one because you know, so I bought this one uh, I knew it had problems but and then to sharpen it get it pretty sharp I spent another hour and a half doing that actually it's therapeutic you know uh, I was watching uh, Dead Man's Gun 1996 series of uh, starting in the 1800s about this uh, 45 Schofield it was a great movie by Henry Winkler was the producer of that back in back then but I was watching a series and I mean the time just went by so fast that a couple of hours was gone so you can do two things at one time so that's kind of how you sharpen these right here uh, there are other techniques you got to find the one that you want to use but that works best for me and I put my finger up here not much pressure well actually right here to make sure that when I go across here on this whetstone uh, that uh, you know, it's flat. The blade is flat. You know, I do the same on this side over here when I do a half a stroke. So that's kind of a little bit about uh, these type of blades right here. Because that the, since the blade is shorter right here, the cutting edge, uh, one and three quarter, it's easier to trim up your beard, your mustache, maybe around your chin and stuff like that than it is to use a three inch blade like you see on the cut through. But uh, you have to make sure you put these up in a good place right here. Now what I did was I have this little casing right here and I just uh, put some tape over that and uh, got this from work and something that's left over. And anyway, it, uh, it had um, a little holder right here. Actually a syringe came in this particular one uh, I work in the medical field, and this was just a leftover box right here. And I was wondering what I was going to do with it, and uh, it fits perfect for this right here. 
and I put a little piece of foam right here and I use a piece of wax paper right here for the blade and the blade again is really sharp uh, and then close it up and that way I don't have to worry about you know dulling that blade or cutting myself with it and so the Commissari is indeed an incredible blade and I hope I give you some idea of the history of these blades right here and how nice they are. Well, thanks for watching, guys. Gary J.